Let's look at some examples of entropy. I put this in, no wonder it's been cold as hell. Someone left the fridge open. That actually makes no sense. Why is it cold? Why is it hell? Oh, well. All right, so let's look at this one here. First of all, we have something that's very common on exams. I need you to know something like this. So we have a closed room, and it contains a refrigerator operating with its door open. Okay, so that means no air can come in or out of this overall room here. But inside, there is a fridge with a pump. For example, a pump or a fan, or that means it has you know heat, uh, you know QH, and of course it's going to be cooling. So there's going to be cold air coming out of it like this, and most people would think, hey, the temperature in the room will decrease, right? But no, I mean only if you have the door closed will the air inside the fridge, you know, decrease. But overall, in this room, you have to remember that there's no such thing as a hundred percent efficient heat engine. In other words, the amount that this pump heats is going to be more than the cooling. In other words, this thing right here will get hotter than this right here gets colder. So what does that mean? That means the temperature of the room will actually increase. Now, isn't that weird? You know, it's a little bit sort of counterintuitive, unless you think carefully about, you know, entropy, for example. And again, just to reiterate, that's because although it's cooling the room, it turns out the fridge and the pump fan will actually warm the room more than it cools. Remember, this is just an application of uh, entropy, where entropy of the universe will increase overall. So that's the second law, for example. So it says that, you know, overall, although the entropy um, you know, might decrease locally, for example, it increases overall. So that's really important to know. This is the application, like I said, of second law. Okay, let's do another example. So here we have a cycle where a heat engine undergoes an isothermal expansion, AB, then an isovolumetric change, BC, and after that an adiabatic compression, CA. Now we know that the temperature at B is larger than the temperature at C. We're told that, okay? So at B here, it's larger. Here, it basically cools. So that's important to know. And the question is, at which point in the cycle, at A or B or C, is the entropy the largest? It's not super obvious, so I thought we would maybe uh, better remind ourselves of the equation for entropy. Do you remember how it goes? It's delta S equals delta Q over T. This is the piece we're going to need to be looking at. In other words, with all these, if we can look at either what happens with temperature or what happens with the change in heat, for example, then we can figure out the change in entropy in each of these processes. Hopefully then we can figure something out. Okay, so let's maybe just look at this first one. We'll just isolate this first process right here, this one right here from A to B. Well, it's going to help to look at a version of delta Q here. So let me modify a little bit uh, our equation right here for delta Q equals delta U plus delta W, just to sort of say a change in Q, change in U, change in W. Because if we can figure that out, then we'll know if delta Q is positive or negative or whatever. Now, uh, the thing is, we know a couple of things from here, don't we? Because it's isothermal, what do we know? So we can say here that the temperature is constant. Right, and if the temperature is constant, what does that mean? That means, you know, we can say delta U equals zero. And let's look at the work uh, done, because remember what this right here, this is work done, which is the area under the curve. Now, which way does it go? It's going to the right. So what does that mean? That means work is positive. So let's maybe write these down then like this. We can say, ah, remember we were always uh, doing this before, where we could say, for example, uh, delta U, we could say delta W and therefore we can say delta Q. So let's figure these out then. So we've kind of got them. Because we know delta U is zero, because it was isothermal, the temperature was constant. Um, delta W we know is a positive. Well then zero plus, let me just put this in. So zero plus, because uh, remember I'm doing delta Q now is delta U plus delta W. So it's zero plus a positive. That means it must be positive. So what does this mean? Well, remember, when delta S, for example, is equal to delta Q over T, and T was constant, remember, because it was isothermal, that means then that we can state without a doubt then that delta S then must be positive. In other words, it increases. So now we know that the entropy increases from A to B. All right, let's do the same kind of treatment, but this time for this one here, this isovolumetric one from B to C. So again, we'll use the same version of the equation right here. So we'll say delta Q equals delta U plus delta W. All right. Well, let's uh, first start off with delta U. What can we do there? 
It sounds a little bit hard, and you could actually work it out by using PV equals NRT and knowing then that the V is constant, so P is proportional to T. And because the pressure goes down, that means the temperature goes down. You could use that. Or you could just use this factor here that told you, hey, the temperature at B is larger than the temperature at C. In other words, the temperature goes down. So if the temperature goes down, what happens to the internal energy? The internal energy also goes down. So that's uh, that's a good one to know. So internal energy goes down. All right, how about this one here? Delta W, remember that's the area under the curve. And what's that area? That area is actually going to be zero, right? Because it's straight down. So the area of that thing right here, the area of this straight down thing is zero. All right, so that means we can deal with everything like we did before with our delta U, our delta W, and our delta Q to figure this out. And let's see what we get. So if we do this delta w, uh, delta U, remember we just said it goes down. Okay, so that's good. It goes down, so it's a minus. Delta W, what happens to that one right there? It's actually zero. And a minus plus zero, what does that tell you? It means it must be a minus. In other words, delta Q goes down. Now, the temperature... Uh, it'll go down as well. We care more about the delta Q here. So this one right here, for example, we can say, hey, delta S then will be down. So the entropy will decrease on this one right here. That's interesting. And if we know that the uh, uh, entropy decreases here, it increases here, well, what about the last one? Let's just look at this last one right here, this adiabatic one. Uh, just to give it the same kind of treatment here, if we go, well, delta Q is equal to delta U plus delta W. Uh, the really important thing here is this. Because it's adiabatic, remember what that means? That means delta Q equals zero. So again, I can just write this down, right? So delta Q equals zero. That's by definition. And if delta Q is zero, that means then that delta S must be zero. So then look at this, then what happens? You've got the entropy from A to B increases. Notice this one here, it increases. So it goes from here, it goes increasing. Then it decreases here. And then it's the same here. There's no change. So where is it the highest then? Does that make sense? It's actually at B because here it went from something low to something higher. Then it went lower and then it stayed the same, the entropy. So that means then if it's in where it goes highest, it must be here. So the entropy must be largest at B. There we go. We've solved a question that I didn't think was super obvious. That's why I thought it was good practice to go through all this right here and deal with entropy on each of these.